<laughs> on T-shirt, we'd welcome now if you could address us. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dennis. Um, ladies and gentlemen, may I say it's a privilege to be to be here at your uh, ninth conference of the UN Broadcasting Commission. Uh, that short video gives you um, a little impression of the personality of, of this country and of its people. Actually, if you saw the, um, the Queen of England, Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth, uh, signing the uh, register of uh, distinguished visitors, that was the first visit by, uh, by a royal uh, in 100 years to Ireland. Those of you who will know anything of our history will know that as a, a country colonised for 700 years, um, this country achieved its independence in the early years of the last, second last century and um, resulted in a civil war uh, with great difficulties for our own people um, and with 30 years of serious trouble from the late 1960s right through the 70s and the 80s, eventually the, um, the terrorist activities and the, uh, the war, as it was called, was brought to a brought to an end by negotiation and discussion called the Good Friday Agreement. And uh, as a consequence of that, um, Queen Elizabeth was able to make a state visit here to the country, as I said, the first in 100 years. That visit is being replicated or responded to formally by the President of Ireland, visiting Great Britain in the next, uh, in the next number of weeks on the first formal state uh, visit as well. Um, I think it shows you the, uh, the extent of connection uh, of Ireland. Fifty years ago last year, uh, the late President Kennedy came here in June of 1963, uh, which was the last international visit before he was assassinated in, in, uh, in, in Dallas. Um, and last year, his daughter and uh, members of their extended family came to Ireland uh, for the 50th anniversary of that visit and re-established the connection for the next generation because the younger members of, that, uh, of the Kennedy family uh, spoke at different locations uh, of, uh, of connection to the family and have reignited a, a continuum of the Irish-American connection. President Obama himself, uh, on one side of his family, has direct Irish connections and received his Certificate of Irish Heritage in the White House um, last year when I had the privilege of, of, of giving him that. But um, as an example, when President Kennedy came here, he presented to the Parliament of Ireland and the people of Ireland a um, flag of the fighting 69th Regiment in the American Civil War, which was, um, which was a banner created by the wives of the soldiers who fought in that regiment. That regiment was commanded by one Thomas Francis Maher, who was deported from Ireland to Van Diemen's Land, which is Tasmania, escaped from there and went to Australia, made his way to Montana, where he became the governor of Montana, and eventually ended up as the, um, as the um, general in charge of the Fighting 69th, was also the person who designed the Irish tricolour, which is a flag of, of green, white and orange. And the significance of that is that the green stands for the nationalist tendencies, uh, the orange stands for the descendants and the supporters over the centuries of William of Orange, uh, which was part of the great battles in this country, uh, and the, and the uh, white is for the peace between the two. And that's, um, that's what we stand for. So I'm glad, uh, Dennis, that you've, you've brought such distinguished uh, guests to our country. And next time I hope they can break out and, and uh, move around from Dublin. No more than America and New York is not the United States. Um, and it's always important that you get a, an understanding of the, of the people that we are. I'm sure um, Dennis O'Brien has explained to you that um, due to our history and the great famine that we had here in the 1840s and subsequent years, that the humanitarian issue in, in our psyche is very strong. And on a proportionate basis, there is no more generous people than the Irish um, throughout the world. And as President Clinton remarked on a number of occasions, this is the one country that can legitimately say that since the UN was founded, uh, somewhere on the planet, every day since then, uh, there are Irish uh, people involved either in peacekeeping missions or humanitarian issues. And whether it be Haiti or whether it be, whether it be Mali or whether it be the Philippines or wherever, um, because of our own understanding of how important these things are. 
uh, we're, we're, we're in there. This uh, broadband commission is something that really excites me in the sense that there are experts around this uh, table here who have in their hands the capacity and the potential uh, to liberate people in so many ways uh, by the capacity of technology now. We've only got four and a half million people here, as the um, little video showed you. We have 70 million worldwide. Uh, and for the first time ever, we're now able to connect all of those together digitally. Um, I was in Seattle last year um, at, a, at a, an Irish-American business function, and uh, all of the people who attended are able to listen to their local radio stations from Ireland. They were actually more acquainted with local news than I was myself, because they have time to listen to it. Um, and the advent of instant connection without any physical connecting wires is something that is so new to people. And when you look at places like Myanmar and these, where you go from zero penetration to uh, full connectivity in such a short time, the impact on culture and tradition and history and people's lives uh, it will be will you know bring enormous uh, shock waves with it in the in the context of, of just how much there, there there the potential there is. Um, so your commission deals with issues of <coughs> connection and liberation, also of uh, privacy, new sense of democracy, if you like, and possibility and accountability. Clearly, these are issues that affect us all. I've looked at your agenda, Dennis. I think it's been it must have been quite riveting to be here to hear some of these contributions uh, and look at the significant developments that have taken place in countries where one might not have thought that would be possible in such a short time. Um, we, uh, as a government, support the objectives of the Commission in recognising the importance of broadband in the international policy area. Why wouldn't we? It's in our interest as, a, as an island nation. Um, and I know that you've been driving not only dialogue but also actions uh, to make broadband more affordable and more um, available, particularly in poorer countries. I see the documentaries on African women, African farmers able to contact their local markets about prices. Uh, all of these things are, are so revolutionary in a democratic sense being uh, developed by, by what comes from your, uh, from your commission. The five uh, targets that you've set, I'm happy to see that they're being monitored and tracked in terms of their, of their, uh, of their rollout. Uh, clearly, this commission has um, personnel or personnel working for people on it with the knowledge and the expertise uh, to make this happen. And that includes industry executives, government leaders, uh, policy pioneers, together with organisations working in the area of social and economic development. Um, and obviously that leaves you very well placed to define and, and to find practical ways to e expand broadband uh, access in every country. So the, um, the demands and the possibilities of the digital era, <clears throat> they transcend national communication mechanisms, national structures and national boundaries. Um, at a European level, the European Council, which is the 28 countries, the leaders of the 28 countries, we have removed physical barriers from country to country in terms of crossing borders, and yet you still have digital borders that we have to remove also to make the digital market and the digital union one to, uh, to uh, um, bring about that real potential. So, if you like, the local becomes global and global becomes local. And for those of you who who will understand that here in Ireland last year we had a, a digital conference where 10,000 creators turned up, innovators, thinkers, imaginative people, um, and they know that when they get the app right or whatever, and touch the button, that it's gone global instantaneously. And that's the real revolution of, uh, of talking to these young people who are creating that future, who are speaking the language beyond the curve. Um, and when I go to schools and see the voluntary movement uh, around this country in what we call Coder Dojo, people writing the code that make things happen, uh, children as young as seven, 
age up to their teenage years are thinking ahead of that curve and are changing the frontiers that lie up ahead of us uh, uh, week by week. So the, the excitement of what lies ahead is as yet unknown um, and where it's going to be in six months or six years or ten years, nobody can actually, uh, can actually um, find out. Well, maybe Dennis O'Brien knows something about that, I'm not sure. Every country is uh, obviously keen to build you know, real quality infrastructure, not only in the foundation of the service, of the industry, and therefore jobs, but about competition and investment. Yeah, countries like Sweden and uh, South Korea are benchmarks for technology and for infrastructure. Um, it's very noticeable that countries that are less well-developed can actually leapfrog by deploying the most advanced technology in the market without having to concern themselves with the existing or the legacy systems and the infrastructure, and that's what's happening. So getting it right, really, is the big challenge for the, for the UN Broadband uh, Commission. And that challenge extends well beyond the infrastructure to the changing nature of commerce and trade, uh, data collection, data storage, data protection, consumer protection, and as a consequence, even taxation. Okay, we've had all the, we've had all the um, discussions about corporation tax rates. Uh, clearly, um, in Ireland, we have a, a set rate based in statute law, but multinationals will use different jurisdictions, um, and the, the legislative world has not moved in, at pace with the digital world. And that's why the OECD are now looking at an international response to an international, uh, an international issue, an international question. Um, so you, you also walk increasingly these days and in this world um, an increasingly difficult line between information and uh, defamation. The balance of uh, freedom of speech and the right to privacy, always an issue with people that's very contentious. Uh, it is a sad uh, but unavoidable fact that there is an anonymous savagery out there that stalks the areas of the social media that can sometimes be anything but social. Not, not lone insults or threats of rape or death or harm to families with those whom we might disagree. It's, a, it's, a, it's one where there's a particular onus on parents to know where their children and teens hang out when they're on the web. As parents, it's just as important to know where your children are, who they're with and what they're doing, as it is to know who they're meeting and talking to in the, uh, in the social media at their disposal so freely. So we are seeing new developments here in tackling uh, child pornography and child, child exploitation. I suppose more positively, the digital era brings rapid communication and news and information around the world in real time. I looked at the pictures from the cockpit of the Australian planes looking for the for the whereabouts, if possible, of the Malaysian uh, uh, 777. This is real connection all over the world for people who have uh, an interest in any, in any, in any particular issue. Um, so here in Ireland, as uh, Dennis pointed out to you, we've got our own national broadband plan and a national digital strategy. Uh, we recognise that, um, that broadband availability is not only critical for business growth and development, but impacts positively on so many other facets of modern life and commerce. Talking to a woman the other day, uh, who's a um, retired housewife, but she makes arrangements for two doctors, uh, doctor's appointments, one in Tokyo and one in New York, uh, from her home in the, in, in the West, um, because of the capacity of the, of the, um, of the digital world. So quality broadband is you know, absolutely crucial to sustainable development in rural or and regional areas. We've got a problem here in Ireland. Many of our, many of our um, provincial parts or rural parts are still not uh, anything to where they should be. And that means that those who are writers or those who, are, who want to live in different parts of the country are still not able to do their business in, to the extent and stage that we would like. So we have uh, serious plans to change all that. I note uh, your report on the special session of the UN Broadband Commission for Digital Development, where you stress the vital importance of countries sharing their experience of, of uh, developing and implementing national broadband plans. I think that's, that's really that's, uh, that's good. Um, obviously, we plan to uh, guarantee high-speed broadband to all citizens and all businesses. We want to do that in two ways. Firstly, by providing both a policy and a regulatory framework which accelerates and incentivizes commercial investment. And secondly, uh, by state-led investment for areas of the country where it's not commercial in the market to invest. 
Now, as we were sitting here, there have been a number of proposals to bring further connection across the Atlantic from the States. Latency in, in uh, banking terms is so important in terms of instantaneous connection. But because of particular problems over the years in this country, there's never been cable, transatlantic cables uh, of the digital nature coming into the country directly. We've ironed that out, and there are a number of propositions to speed it up, which if they land on the west coast or the south coast, would actually uh, in, enable us to light up the entire, the entire country uh, to, the, to the highest level for pursuing that. So infrastructure is, uh, is one thing. Increasing the levels of digital adoption in the economy and society is another. This is an issue for us. That's why the National Digital Strategy was published in 2013. It's got a three priorities. One, getting more businesses trading online. Five billion euro worth of business done online in this country. The vast majority of that comes in from outside. It might be good for post offices, but when you explain to people uh, the potential of their own creative um, capacity uh, uh, to sell abroad is where you need to be. Example. Uh, I called in 10 or 12 businesses recently to government buildings to discuss this. Some who were started, some who were at it for a while, some who were experienced. And um, one woman, boutique, uh, women's clothing, uh, going well, went online, sell internationally. First orders from Singapore and the Far East. What a good quality European clothing for particular people. So uh, here is an opportunity for our people to understand that potential is what it is. But for many of them, because they struggle in economic uh, challenges to keep their business very much alive, they don't have the time to, you know, um, to promote in the way that they would like the website. So we need backup systems for that. Be uh, website managers to say, like, here's where we need to keep this, keep this business moving. Um, also, uh, the digital classroom. We have the best demographics of any country in Europe for the next 25 years. We pride ourselves on our education system, which is not perfect, but it's able to measure up. Um, but because of the structure of our educational system, it's very important for people that they have access to this, uh, to this quality. So most secondary schools are now up to speed with broadband. But it also means that the, the, the nature of teaching and instruction has to change completely. A young student now can draw down mountains of information literally about any subject off the net. And the role of the teacher, the educator, the lecturer has got to change in being a counsellor, a guider, a sifter through what is important in terms of information so that where talent is identified that it can be allowed to, 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 uh, to flourish. And in that sense, it means that if you've got a seriously, a seriously capable young person in mathematics or physics or whatever it might be, but because of the structure of the curriculum and the numbers, they don't have sufficient teachers to teach them. That's where the online, the online connection can be for students who have the capacity to take really complex courses, and I, we support that ser seriously. And getting more citizens online. I met a man recently, and he raised a subject with me, and I said, James, where did you come across this information? Oh, he said, I googled it up, and he's 92. <laughs> so it just shows you that um, the, 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 the complexity, they don't have to understand how it works so long as it does work. And the point is that lifelong learning is a concept that's been alive in the Far East for very many years. Uh, it's something that's sort of new to, or newer, should I say, to Western countries. And it's, uh, it's an issue that, that, um, that um, we, we've tended in Western countries to forget about, in that people, when they reached retirement age, retired and faded away. That shouldn't be, because you should never lose experience or wise counsel or that kind of uh, potential, and it's all there through the digital world. So um, that's done in terms of the, in terms of the, um, of the, the secondary school system. So they're the three areas that we want to do with that. Um, might I just say in response to what uh, Dennis said to you, We've come through a pretty catastrophic period here where the country went over the edge because of uh, an, an allegiance to property development only. And because the tools were not available at a European Union level to assist a country like Ireland, our population had, was required to borrow 64 billion and attempt to pay it back. So this has been a, this has been a real challenge for people with negative equity, mortgage distress, unemployment, emigration. Um, and it's taken, some, it's taken some real courage from people to actually uh, put in place a plan and a strategy and a process to move the country out of that. 
I'm glad to say uh, that we were the first uh, Eurozone country to emerge from an IMF EU bailout programme last December, and we did so without any precautionary credit line. That was, uh, that, if you like, was reflected in the market sentiment towards Ireland uh, subsequently when the first offering uh, of monies was oversubscribed by more than you would get in a precautionary credit line anyway. Just one statistic. In mid-June 2011, interest rates for Ireland were blocked out of the markets were 15%. Last Monday fortnight, on a 10-year offering, there were 2.9%, which shows you the, the uh, objectivity of market sentiment towards the country where they recognise that serious progress is being made. It's also interesting that of the 60,000 new jobs that were created last year, 40% of those came from companies that are less than five years old, many of them in the areas where you're working. Uh, and that shows you, in, in its own way, the... Um, the initiative and the interest um, and the capacity of young minds to change that future. So uh, in a taxation sense and in a, in a budget sense, we've had to reflect the importance of small and medium enterprises, which are the backbone of uh, every society, be able to, uh, to, be able to, 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 move, uh, to move forward. So uh, as we exited the programme, uh, people said, well, where, what's the next step? Where, where, where are we going now? So uh, simultaneously, we published a medium-term economic strategy for 2% growth this year, 25 next year, 3% the year after, have our deficit below 3% by 2015, have it eliminated by 2018, and get back to what you call full employment, in other words, the restoration of all the jobs that were lost during the period by 2020. So investment into the country is very strong, exports out of the country very strong, right across America last, last week. Uh, these were discussions with uh, business interests and in, investors in the, in the country here. So in that sense, you know, as I said, you'll find Irish people from the cleaner to the president or the chief executive uh, in, in, in most countries in the world. I was at the European Council meeting last week, and um, uh, clearly uh, the Crimea and Ukraine was an issue that dominated proceedings there with potential for, for real, real uh, upset and real uh, unrest. Um, but I was just reflecting that uh, in the Crimean War in 18, 1850s, 30,000 Irish men lost their lives in, in the Crimean War. Um, and it was interesting that one of the delegation who was on the OSCE monitoring delegation, which was not allowed in to Sebastopol, was an Irishman again. And only 50 years after that, this is the centenary of the commencement of the Great War, the war to end all wars. We lost um, you know, 50,000 men, a million slaughtered in the Somme, another million slaughtered in Flanders and all of these. So. It's all part of our, our understanding of why we should help other countries. And you've been doing this in Haiti and other places. And that's um, part, if you like, of our understanding of the importance of the Millennium Development Goals, which is also a target of the, of the Commission here. So really, the, uh, the post-2015 uh, development framework gives us a once-in-a-generation opportunity uh, to get this right. And from that point of view, allows us to eradicate extreme poverty ensure that people all over the planet can have a, an opportunity to have a decent standard of living. When I, I was at the G8 summit in, um, in Fermanagh in, in Northern Ireland last year. Ireland's not a member of the G8, uh, but I was invited because we had the presidency of the European Union uh, by Prime Minister Cameron. And during our presidency, we achieved quite a significant element of technical issues put across the line, including, I might say, the uh, the um, mandate to get discussions underway between Europe and the United States in terms of what they call the TTIP uh, arrangements for free trade, with the potential for millions of jobs on the side of the Atlantic, and the capacity to set down regulations for world trade for the next 50 years. But there were African leaders at the G8 summit. And it's a pity that it wasn't actually televised live. It was far from the sort of perception that you get of... Uh, of uh, uh, just uh, nonsensical talk going on at these meetings. It was it was quite riveting, in fact. And then quite a number of African leaders spoke about the democratisation of their countries, which are vast in extent, the extent of corruption, the extent of uh, the extent of the rape of the soil and the uh, extraction of minerals for no return for so many local communities. Um, and it was President Obama actually who said, "Well, look." One thing that we could do in response to these measures are to give them the capacity to communicate, uh, 
but also give them the opportunity to have real legal advice and tax advice from experienced people who would see that contracts that are drawn up wherever actually give a real return to the uh, communities and the tribes and the, and the different countries. It's well recognised from a European point of view that with the population of Africa likely to double in the next 20 years, um, that if, if even 10% of young males were to decide to emigrate to, uh, to Europe, no country could withstand the pressure of that. So here's, in my view, here's an example of a continent that will explode democratically and economically in the next 20 years. Um, and the Broadband Commission and the Millennium Development Goals, I think, are, uh, are, um, are, uh, are so important and so achievable, actually. So, in many ways, what you're doing is, uh, is really a humanitarian issue of giving a voice to the voiceless, um, of, uh, of giving opportunity. Uh, through the through the broadband business, so it's a it's a possibility uh, that we will explore, that we will maximise, um, if we dare to imagine, what those young people said to me last last year here in Ireland, that we've got to think not outside the box, but beyond the curve. Um, I am always fascinated by the concept of um, infinity. Um, I looked at the at the um, documentaries and the information about the Big Bang theory as to where this universe came from. And they were speaking of the uh, explosion and the expansion of the universe in a trillionth of a trillionth of a trillionth of a second. And now they tell me that our cosmos is only one of thousands. Um, so when um, Voyager left the solar system with its 36-year-old technology, before it left, they turned around to take one shot, and it did. Uh, and in that, in that massive square of darkness, there's one little blue pixel, which is where you are. Uh, so in that scale of infinity, we have the capacity to, uh, to make an impact. And arising from the loss of the, or the disappearance of the aircraft uh, from Malaysia, I was astounded, actually, and you know more about this than I do, uh, that less than 10% of the world surface is, is, um, is radarized, if you like, where they have real, real analysis of what's happening. And yet, you can have a GPS locator for every square centimeter of soil on the planet. So I support what you're doing with the Broadband Commission. I uh, support the development goals. I, I, I fully um, ad admire your, your five major targets. And um, it's a privilege to be here. Welcome you to Ireland and hope that you can come back again. We are a gregarious, curious, inquisitive people. And the trick is, if you come here for a week, you won't want to go home at all. Thank you. <laughs>